often architects don't understand how competitive it is, how hard it is to be published, how many people are good, doing good work, and what the real landscape is. Business of Architecture, episode 311. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Whenever you're meeting with a potential client who's considering using your firm, one of the primary questions in their mind is going to be, why should I use you over all of my other options, including the option of doing nothing? And how you answer this question has everything to do with whether projects come easily to you from the right clients or whether you always feel like you're one step behind the competition. If you can answer this question succinctly, well, and powerfully, and it aligns with your firm's DNA, that is a powerful combination. In today's episode, we're going to get deep into how to uncover not only your own secret sauce, your unique differentiator, how to have that very honest, real, raw conversation with yourself, but how you can then use that differentiation to position your firm in the marketplace for the kind of projects and work that you aspire to do. Today's guest is an expert and a practitioner that helps firms refine and hone this kind of messaging. Her name is Iva Kravitz. Iva is the founder of the Iva Agency. She helps design-focused firms develop a marketing plan based around their vision and goals. So without further ado, here's my conversation with our guest today, Iva Kravitz. Hello, Iva, and welcome to the Business of Architecture. Hi. How are you, Enid? Oh, I'm just, I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for asking. And the first question I have for you today is your opinion on branding. This is something that gets tossed around a lot, and a lot of people have different opinions. For you, what is branding? Oh, wow. So I guess I could start by saying that to a lot of architects, I think when you say the word branding, it's jargon, and that it just sounds like a word that people toss around, but that the same way I think that a lot of what I do as an architectural communications and marketing person is really simple if you just sit down and think through it and that it's not rocket science. Branding in its simplest form is being able to explain who you are as an architect or an architectural office, why you are you and not someone else, why being able to explain and really understand why anyone hires you and being able to articulate that as opposed to hiring someone else assuming you're not their, you know, son-in-law, and um, being able to explain not just your difference in the market, but what your own specific thoughts and experiences are and how that ties into the DNA of your firm. And in the best case, how those thoughts and experiences are reflect are reflected in your work because in the very best cases around branding and architecture a firm will have such a strong thought process and set of values and set of experiences and beliefs that those thoughts and experiences will be reflected in the work and will actually uh, form almost a basis for the work in a way that's, if not visible, then kind of palpable, for lack of a better word, over the course of the firm's life or the architect's of or experience. Does that make sense? What does it look like when it's done? And can you give me an example to help us help us understand the difference between perhaps an ineffective implementation of this concept that you just shared with us versus an effective implementation. What contrasts those for me, if you would? Okay, yeah, because what I just said is a lot, there are a lot of thoughts that are kind, kind of tied into that. So I would say ineffective branding is number one, generic, where, where a firm's kind of identity statement is A, list services and B lists things that anyone can say. And I'm so sorry to say that there are a lot of firms, there are a ton of firms whose identity statement is about 
being architects who are thoughtful, who are good listeners, good problem solvers, and design appropriate buildings or solutions. Those four things come up painfully often in architectural websites or people's descriptions of their firms. And the fact is they may all be true, but they're all so true that they become utterly generic and there's absolutely no point of difference between those kinds of statements and a statement bound in a deeper belief system or someone's specific experience. So I would say ineffective are really generic descriptions, you know, that start with, we are a um, group of architects who are great listeners, good problem solvers, and who design appropriate solutions to uh, design problems. It's utterly generic, as opposed to an effective uh, marketing or branding statement that's really drilled down on someone's core beliefs, like an effective state would be something like, we think that um, art is a core uh, cultural value that drives our business, our design thinking, and we use art as a launch point for everything we do um, as architects. Now, I'm not saying that that's the most logical point of view, but the point is it's not generic. It's, uh, it's something a little different. It's perhaps true that someone really believes that art and the importance of art culturally should be reflected in everything they do. I mean, just as a starting point. But the fact is that when I talk to small businesses or very small firms and people say, well, you know, what, what do I do that's different? What, how do I describe my difference? Because I do solve problems and I'm a good listener. You know, what I really say to them is think about your own experience. Think about where you grew up. Think about where you, what you did as a child. Think about what made you want to be an architect. Think about what was the most important thing to you in school or where you've traveled or what experiences have been important to you and have really, really contributed to the way you think and the way you practice and talk about those because those will not be generic. They'll be specific, they'll be authentic, and they will be true to who you are as an architect and as a practice. That's very clear. Thank you for contrasting those two. And you mentioned some of the key points in terms of what goes into a brand is describing why someone hires you, why you started your business in the first place. And you kind of alluded to that in your example from the, you know, how we could go about coming about that for ourselves. When you think about why someone might hire a firm, how does a firm owner come up with, you know, well, they hire us because we do a good job, because they like us. How would you suggest helping someone in that situation to find their core message or genius that's going to make them stand out? <laughs> that's a, re, Enoch, that's a really interesting question. And I'm sort of thinking about a guy who called me about two years ago and someone gave him my name and he wanted to talk. And when I went in to talk to him about his practice, it was, you know, eight people, 10 people. And I said, so why do people hire you? And he said, because I'm a really nice guy and it's, really easy to work with me. And I said, that's a good answer. Do you really, is that true? And he said, yeah, it's a hundred percent true. I know that because people tell it to me all the time. So like his position was kind of being a nice guy. <laughs> and one of the things that was a little refreshing about that is that it's not a bad position it's an honest position. And I kind of said to him, well, you know, you should own that. And it wasn't really that I was suggesting that his tagline be, uh, you know, Joe Brown, we're nice guys, architects, we're nice guys. But he was extremely clear about it. And he said, you know, we'd, he wasn't aspiring to be a high designer. He wasn't aspiring to be a 
super elite um, star architect. He just wanted to be a service firm, and he was really clear about his definition of being a service firm and of wanting to be, you know, easy to work with for his clients. And that's a perfectly acceptable market position, as opposed to, I'll go back to ineffective. Uh, I had a client who I worked with for several years that was a very large uh, office that uh, did um, a lot of corporate interiors. And one of the things that was really interesting and ultimately kind of frustrating, not just for me as their communications person, but for themselves, was that they couldn't actually figure out if they were a design firm or a service firm. And they would kind of ping pong between those two uh, points of difference. And it made it very kind of complicated to help them with press or messaging or even writing their descriptions because about half the time they were just doing service work like bank branches and, um, you know, offices that had miles and miles of beige carpet. And about half the time they were really doing some interesting design that was pushing the boundaries of kind of what was happening in corporate interiors at that time. So they were a little schizophrenic and that makes it harder. But I guess what I'm trying to get to is that really if knowing what your position is in the market, what you want to do as a firm, who you want to be, how you want people to think of you. These are core questions and issues in how, not just how you um, present yourself, but the fact that you want to present yourself authentically and truly, because when you're in your own authenticity, people will perceive that it's palpable, it's perceivable, it's immediately something that people respond to, as opposed to being a, you know, six person office that, you know, where most of your business is maybe kitchens and bathroom renovations, and walking into a, a new potential project, and trying to be something you're not or trying to, uh, you know, make the case for being able to, you know, design a multi-story, multi-unit building. People see through that and they will perceive it and they will respond to it negatively. Whereas if you're honest about who you are and why you do what you do and you've really given it some thought, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's, a, it's an introspective and in a sense, painful exercise for a lot of people to really say, where is my truth? Where is my identity? What, what is my experience that has brought me to this place? How can I articulate, I articulate it? And how will it serve me? That is the, where I, I would suggest any architect, you know, that's the process I would suggest any architect go through to get to an authentic place around branding or their own identity. Iva, what have you seen to be, in your work with firms and other firms you've just observed, what have you seen to be the, the kind of key characteristics that the successful firms, when I say successful, I mean that align with the owner's version of success or the shareholders or the partners or whoever's in charge, what have been sort of the success criteria of the things that you see these firms doing that other firms who want to get there but are just struggling and on the treadmill aren't aren't quite getting? I think, Enoch, that I'm going to answer this question, but I also am going to explain that I'm maybe biased in that I'm, I'm really interested in firms that I say are values-based. And when I use that phrase, what I mean is that they are working perhaps socially or environmentally responsibly where they have given thought to what their work is and made a commitment publicly, internally and externally to do work that is serving a social purpose or um, moving the dial, hopefully environmentally. And um, so the firms that I have worked with successfully have 
used that commitment in their work to develop their brands. And of course, that's a really winning conversation because they're articulating a mission and a set of values and a, uh, a, an, a position that is something they want to do. And when an architect uh, makes that commitment to work, you know, toward social justice or uh, to being sustainable or to um, working for uh, clients who are themselves uh, the kinds of nonprofits that are doing good work, there's a kind of meaningfulness in the work that makes it really easy to explain the brand and explain the thinking behind it. And of course, the work reflects those values and the, uh, the arc of the narrative for a project or for the firm are very consistent. You know, there's a, there's a kind of set of values about what's important to that firm. Uh, and I'll, I'll use a good example. So one of my examples, my clients is Cook Fox, and it's a New York City-based firm. It's 100 people. It's a firm that's very committed to um, designing for health and wellness and uh, ideas of biophilia, which means love of nature, even in a dense city. And Cook Fox designed, in fact, a building called One Bryant Park, which is um, – in the middle of Midtown, New York, it opened, unfortunately, in 2008, right at the height of the real estate crisis. But it was at the time and is still one of only a tiny number of lead platinum skyscrapers. And they did a lot of very um, revolutionary things, like they used um, like concrete and composting toilets and uh, not composting toilets, sorry, composting in the building and low flow toilets and uh, regeneration and uh, an innovative heating mm -hmm. cooling system. And those ideas are ideas that reflected their commitment to sustainability, high performance, and good design. And the building reflects those ideas. And these uh, underlying commitment to health and well-being and to high performance and um, a healthy building in the middle, even the middle of a super dense city, are ideas that are picked up in every building and every project that the firm does. So there's a great arc of responsibility and concern for human health in everything in the portfolio. And that makes it very easy to talk about the brand and to talk about the ideas behind the brand and to talk about consistency and to know that there's a value system behind the brand. So that's what I would call a very successful um, a successful marketing as opposed to, so the big firm I mentioned earlier that was couldn't decide if they were service firm or a design firm and they were kind of schizophrenic and they did both and they didn't know how to describe themselves. They're a really interesting and, of course, ultimately unsuccessful story where at one point they wanted to rebrand and kind of burnish their image. And we talked about rebranding, and I suggested bringing in a very experienced, um, very uh, thoughtful and intelligent small branding agency to help them go through the process because there were, I think, eight partners. And I knew that if they worked with this agency, even though it would be painful and it would be force a lot of introspection and it would be a prolonged process. But I knew that if they went through that process, that they would come up with not just an answer as to whether they were a service firm or a design firm, but if it's done right and a firm works with a branding company like that, you you actually know your succession plan as well, which for this particular firm would have been helpful. There were eight partners. Some of them were had been there a very long time. It would have been a 
painful process for them, but it would have solved a lot of problems in the long run. They chose not to do that. They had their in-house graphics team make a new logo. It was a little more modern. They moved right around the same time, and they uh, uh, they changed the way the website looked, and they called it a rebranding. Well, it was a brand refresh, but I think you could argue that they didn't do the hard work that would have allowed them to say they really rebranded. They were still the kind of murky, confusing identity that they had been. It just looked a little fresher. What I'm what I'm hearing, Iva, is that one of the keys here is a realization and honesty and self-discovery that a firm has about what core values, what what they value, who they are, their DNA. And then after they come to that realization and clarity, translating that DNA into everything they do, including their marketing messages, including even the work that they do. Especially, especially and including the work they do. And that's right. And thank you for restating that in a clearer way, because I, I'm, I know that I'm think I'm talking about a lot of uh, kind of thoughts that I'm trying to synthesize into um, maybe to to uh, pat a box. And I guess that's exactly right. For whether you're a two person firm or a single practitioner or a 300 person office, I think it's incredibly important to understand what the common goals of the office are, what's important to the office, what's not important, how an office wants to be known, how a practice wants to be known. And that is underscored by the owners being able to articulate what's important to them and what their values are and being able to articulate it, to put it out into the world, to know what you're not, (laughs) what's not important to you and what is important to you, and to be able to build a practice around it where the work and the thought behind the work is an extension of and a reflection of your values and your priorities. That is very difficult. It is difficult, but it is also incredibly important because once you go through that hard work, whether it's right when you're starting or maybe you've been just kind of floating along and people have been calling you and you've had a reasonably happy amount of work in the six years you've been in business, but you want to get to the next level. And I would suggest that going through that hard work and being able to defend and explain your brand and your position in the market will, again, not only serve you as you, you know, talk about the next job, but it will make everything ultimately in your communications easier. It will make your um, your statement of who you are and your firm profile easier to write and to articulate. And it will also it will also ideally explain why your buildings look the way they do or why your interiors look the way they do, because they're backed by a kind of thinking that is going to be consistent and that is going to be um, easy to both explain and to, re, uh, how do I say this, to synthesize that who you say you are is consistent with the work that you're putting forward and the um, the identity you have and your brand in the market. And I guess one of the things I want to say about this, which is, sounds like a simple truism is that, you know, when the markets are good and money's flowing, it feels like there's enough work for everybody and that, you know, everybody gets a little work, but when money's tighter and the markets and economies start to drop, 
firms that are going to be successful are firms that are either better established and bigger and better well-known and more visible, which is always a truism because they represent less risk. But for smaller firms who are looking to differentiate themselves, if an owner or a potential client is talking to three architects and two of them are a little fuzzy on the edges around who they are, but one of them walks in with clarity and authenticity and a message of who they are and why their values are what they are and why their work reflects it, I would argue that that clearer person is going to be a much, much more compelling uh, architect and someone who would more easily and more logically get this job. Iva, in terms of, so we've covered the messaging, probably not half as deeply as we could over that we should have, but when we move on, let's move on to some tactical things in terms of press and communication. So let's say that we have figured out our DNA structure for our messaging. We now, we're clear about who we represent. We're clear about why people hire us. We're, we're, we've enunciated that, made it clear in terms that are different from our competition. What have you found to be effective to heighten the firm's visibility in terms of tactical approaches like marketing, communication, social media, networking? I think that, again, you know, assuming someone's got a clear message and a good brand statement and a good brand identity, um, one of the things that people often struggle with is, is getting published or how to explain what a what's important about a project. And I think that um, to the designers, sometimes it's obvious because they've been living and breathing the project. But to the outside world, one of the things that I you know tell clients is that not everything is equally important. So um, one of the things I try to explain when we're looking at sort of press opportunities or ways to describe our projects is that um, every building has five or six different narratives or five or six different stories and that those different pieces will attract different audiences. And that when you kind of, once you can kind of parse the um, stories out from the project, you'll know who your audiences are. And I'll give you an example. Every building has a real estate story because it's in a place. And every building has a business story because some amount of money changed hands. And every project has a design story because there's a design and perhaps a material story. And in the best case, there are interesting materials or interesting materials used in a new way. Maybe there's a sustainability story for a project. Um, Maybe there's really something innovative about it. And maybe... There's a market sector story. It's a school, and you know that other schools would be interested in it. So, but not all of those things are going to be equally important. So I suggest to people that they think about what are the, what are the really interesting things about the project and who of those in those different stories, who are the audiences who will be interested in it? So in other words, if, It's a big project and a lot of money changed hands. Business editors and investors and real estate and brokers will be interested in it. If it's, you know, in an interesting place or there's a there's a real estate backstory or the building or the project creates a new real estate environment. Then there was a real estate community who will be interested in it. And similarly, you know, if it's a school, other schools and school facilities people and school directors and school um, people who work in schools and deans and and, uh, faculty will be interested in that. So there's some point, uh, there are certain points of every project that have an organic and logical audience. And once I ask people to kind of work with me to figure out what are the big stories of the project, then it becomes very easy to think about who would be interested in that and 
how then we have to think about how to get in touch with them and how to market to them. And, uh, you know, it that understanding will dictate press and, and whether or not there's a logical press outreach. It may be that a new school isn't really interesting in its local area, but that other schools are going to be interested in it because of what's going on inside. So we would pitch it to just school trades. And that's okay because people who read trade magazines about schools are all hiring architects to design schools. I think that trade magazines aren't very sexy to a lot of people, but they're really important because the only people who read them are people in that business. Anyway, um, similarly, it may be that um, sending an e-blast is the most effective way to let people know about the important stories of a certain project, or it may be that um, have, may, doing a lecture at a conference is the best way to get the story out. So anyway, once you know what the important stories are around a project, then we sit down and we try to talk about what it makes the most sense in getting the message out and explaining the uh, worthy and the notable areas of that project. So we find the stories is what you're suggesting, what I'm hearing. We then pair up the stories with the, the, the audiences that want to hear those stories. And then we figure out a logical way to find the audiences and the most obviously cost-effective and um, direct way to find the organic and logical audience who's going to be interested in whatever the most interesting aspect of the project is. And I guess, Enoch, the converse of that is that um, I've definitely been in a lot of situations where I've worked with architects who have done kind of a mediocre project um, and who expect us to put it into the New York Times. And my um, comment to them and my comment to anybody in, who's got that expectation where there's a huge gap between reality and someone's expectation is to think as critically and as objectively as possible about whether or not a story deserves to be in the New York Times or, you know, deserves to be published. Not every project is going to be worthy of being published. And I, and I guess uh, that's something that comes up for me all the time because um, people's expectations are you know, that if you hire an outside consultant or a PR agency or a publicist, that they'll just take every single thing that comes out of your office and trot it over to, you know, Arc Record Magazine or Architect Magazine and get it published. But um, it's not really how it works. And even though it's true that magazines and blogs and uh, newsletters and uh, good news outlets, uh, good design outlets like Dezine, which is only online, um, are looking for content, it's still very competitive to get published or to get uh, chosen. And just because you've hired a publicist doesn't mean you're <laughs> going to be published. You're going to be published if the work is of high quality and if the work is meaningful or innovative or going back to that idea of parsing the story or has some aspect that people are interested in. That's how publishing works. And that's how, um, what it means or what it starts to look like when you hire a publicist. And I will also say that sometimes I speak to groups of marketers and my comment to, uh, you know, people in marketing staff is that if your principals or your designers are asking you to get something published, they can't answer the question of why or what's important about this or who cares to be blunt. If they can't answer the question of why should anyone care about this project, then, you know, you kind of have to go back to them and say, rethink it or, you know, um, what is there to work with? And, I only I say that because um, I think perhaps 
often architects don't understand how competitive it is, how hard it is to be published, how many people are good, doing good work, and um, what the real landscape is. And I and I guess another point of that is that so many hard copy publications have gone out of business, and it's every month more go out of business, stop being printed. There's so few left that it gets triply hard to be, uh, you know, published in a big national architecture magazine because there are only a few out there. And they're really looking for important, innovative, interesting, thoughtful work. Um, so that's a that's another aspect of what I do that comes up a lot. What would you suggest principals, firm owners, people who are in marketing positions do when their work isn't necessarily, they don't see it as groundbreaking, it may not have a huge story, it may not be something that necessarily they think they could pitch to one of those big publications. What approaches would you recommend that they take? Well, I'd go back to what I said earlier and simplify it and and think about what is worthy in the building. And if it's not worthy to be published in a big national magazine, is there a real estate story? Is there a local story that a local paper or publication might be interested in? Is it something that might be interesting to a local business group or a local, um, another group of architects or to students or to, um, again, in, in its market sector into similar businesses, um, even though it's not mm, the quality of something that would go into architectural record, it doesn't mean that the project doesn't have uh, good qualities and that other similar businesses wouldn't be interested in the project, at which point I would think about, you know, looking at my mailing list and saying, are there people on my mailing list who are in this business who, or, you know, who do similar kinds of projects who would be interested in this one. In other words, I've done a wing of a hospital and it's not that innovative and it's a brick built. It's a brick extension, but um, it was very cost effective and the construction process went very well and the clients thrilled with it because Every room has a view, and um, everybody, everybody in the, all the patients uh, are comfortable, and it's very well lit. So that's not record. That's not, you know, super news. Every room has a view. Every room is well lit, and patients are comfortable. That's not going to get you into national magazine, but it's going to be interesting to other hospitals in the area. It's going to be interesting to hospitals that don't have budgets for architects, but want to expand in a reasonable way. And they're going to be interested in the fact that the construction was expedient and that it was on budget and that, um, and that uh, every patient has a view because it's been proven that that uh, promotes shorter hospital stays, it's more efficient situation. So at that point, you have to think about who's the audience of hospitals in the area who might want to expand. And that requires a little research. It requires making perhaps a new mailing list or finding a new set of uh, a new organization to speak to, like the local hospital uh, group or the local, you know, hospital administrators group. But it's like, that's the kind of thinking you have to do to think about how to promote a project that's not you know, an award-winning, super innovative front-end project. There are a lot of worthy and notable projects, but you have to think through who's going to be interested in them, who who wants to see them, and what part of them, what aspect of them are interesting, interesting to, again, logical, organic audiences. Iva, what would you recommend would be the first steps that you would recommend to our audience listeners to take to, if they want to improve their communication and their public relations in their firm? Okay. So let me use an example of a firm that I worked with 
that did restaurant design. And they were very well known for restaurant design. And they had designed 75 restaurants that were really notable. And over 10 years of working with them, um, I had gotten their name into so many <laughs> so many publications that rather than being a footnote uh, in talking about restaurant design, their names became the lead in any review of a restaurant. You know, it, it was, it went, the reviews went from not mentioning the designer at all to headlining with, this was a Bogdanow designed restaurant. Uh, and it went on from there. So they were really well established in restaurants. But the firm wanted to do hotels also. It's an extension of the hospitality uh, industry. But they'd never done a hotel. So when we thought about how to move from one market into the other, we were thinking, well, we've done restaurants and we want to do hotels. But the reality is there are restaurants in hotels. And we should try to do a couple of hotel restaurants because then we'd actually be in the building. And we started including hoteliers in our mailings uh, about restaurants. And we started talking to hoteliers and not surprisingly, um, a couple of hoteliers uh, invited the firm to do uh, hotel restaurants, destination restaurants in hotels. And that eventually led to um, being commissioned to do the interior of an entire hotel. So that's a very logical way to think about how an existing project and a existing market sector can, uh, you can't see my fingers, but they're opening. You know, they're going from being, my thumb and forefinger are going from being really tight to being really open. We took a tight market sector like restaurants and turned it into all of hospitality, hotels and restaurants by shifting our focus a little bit and shifting our mailing list and thinking about who logically would be interested in hotel restaurants and ultimately hotel design, hotel interiors. That was a very successful um, way to meet our goals, which at that time, we said were to take go from restaurants to hotels. And similarly, if you want, if you're three people and you want to be ten people, it makes sense to talk about your largest project to people who do that scale projects and larger in a related industry. Those are the people who are going to be not just interested in what you're doing, but who are going to be able to commission larger projects to get you to 10 people. Iva, where would you send people? Where should they go to find out more about you and your work? <laughs> I have a website. It's a little bit like the cobbler's children. It's a little out of date. I am working on it, or let me put it this way. I will work on it in 2020. It's um, theivaagency.com. And uh, it's a work in progress, as are all of our websites. Um, and I can also be found on LinkedIn uh, under Iva Kravitz and uh, also on social media, on Instagram at the Iva Agency. Iva, thanks so much for joining us here. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Enoch, thanks so much for having me. I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelming fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.